Hmm. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I am the Crypto Crow. It's about 1030 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to go over quite a bit of stuff that I think you're going to find quite interesting. So make sure you stick around to the end, because the end, I've got uh, some significant news you're definitely going to want to hear. But in the meantime, we're looking at the Bitcoin weekly chart right now. Currently trending up, and I know it's faking everybody out. <laughs> um, but what we're seeing here, we're seeing Bitcoin on a weekly and we're seeing a green 50 moving average, and we're seeing it over a uh, a tan uh, 200 moving average. And as you can see, these two are looking to cross over likely within the next week or two. And I'm thinking to myself, what would cause this to go one way or the other? And I'm gonna show you in a bit. But ultimately, if you're looking at this green 50, Never before in Bitcoin's history on a weekly chart has the 50 moving average crossed down over the 200. And, you know, every time it gets close, basically we start an uptrend, right? Here we, we started, we came down really hard. Oh gosh, it looks so close. And then boom, away we went into the, into the market peak. And, you know, I feel that this is very misleading. Um, but I could be wrong. Uh, this is just one of those things. Now, while a lot of your technical analysts are looking at this and they're saying, oh, we're going to the moon, we're going to be in a bull market again, and we're, you know, all of these things are happening, there are some things that I want to point out that I don't think many people really talk about. A lot of these guys and gals, they look at the charts and they're, they, just, they just go by what the charts are showing them. And... Are we likely going to get another bit of a pump? Maybe. Do we get to 25,000? Maybe. Um, you know, I, I think ultimately there are some significant outliers in the current market that, that we have not seen before, quite frankly. I mean, if you think about it, Bitcoin came around in 2009, didn't do really much of anything other than, you know, allow people to pay 10,000 Bitcoins for a Domino's pizza, um, you know, I mean, it had a very sketchy beginning early on, a lot of the cyberpunks and them, you know, using Bitcoin for things. And and that's fantastic. It's obviously come a long way. Uh, but we're seeing the tokenization of a variety of new assets. We're seeing the development of significant third generation blockchains capable of t taking on all ultimately global use cases for governance, for uh, governments, for, um, you know, obviously a, a hell of a lot more than just NFTs uh, and DeFi. Although I do believe that DeFi is going to be another significant wing of this next leg of this next market. And I also believe that artificial intelligence, obviously growing in prominence right now, is going to play a big role in the next market as well. And I'm going to be looking and diving deeper into artificial intelligence uh, type cryptocurrency projects. Let me know in the comments if there are any that you think I should be looking into, because maybe you guys can point me in the direction of some that I might otherwise miss on my own. But that's a new effort that I'm looking to get into, because obviously with with applications like Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion and uh, Chat GPT and so much of that stuff, I think AI is going to be a really, really big deal in the net, in the future of the market. And not only that. But, you know, where are we going to store a lot of this growing, these growing models? I mean, we're going to get to a point where AI driven models are are just insanely huge. Are those going to be stored centrally? Are those going to be on centralized platforms? Or are they going to be more decentralized in the future using things like Filecoin and Siacoin and and other types of projects like that to store this constantly growing, uh, likely exponentially growing data models uh, so we'll see, but I definitely think that ultimately it's just a matter of time until the entire world is on, on some form of P2P uh, decentralized system. Now, uh, as far as Bitcoin short term, we may very likely go up and break above this 200 weekly moving average, but whether or not the 200 crosses over, uh, that would be the first time in history on a weekly chart. And this is a logarithmic scale uh, chart as well. So you're kind of getting rid of some of the noise. Now, uh, 
doing videos in the morning is rough because I'm still waking up. I woke up at like 7 a.m., 6.45. I actually woke up earlier than my wife, but good news is I weighed 280 pounds this morning. I have come down, what is that now, 30 pounds? I think it was like 310 when I started, uh, and I'm down to 280, so that's a 30-pound drop. Uh, it's pretty crazy. I can actually start to see fat abs now. It's pretty good. <laughs> fat abs, the dad bods of the world unite. Uh, so anyway, let's take a look at what's going on that I think is going to ultimately play some roles in what's happening in the Bitcoin market, as well as the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 and everything else, because I think the first week of February is going to be quite telling. So let's dive into that. And then we're going to get into some Cardano news and some other stuff. A group of House Republicans are pushing to eliminate most federal taxes and replace them with a federal sales tax in a plan that would also abolish the IRS. Now, before you get all excited about any of this, it's not happening, just so you know. Biden's going to veto it if it even gets to his desk, which it's not. But this is basically a way for the, for the righties to show the lefties, hey, look, the Democrats want you to be taxed like crazy. Um, and I'm sure that the lefties are going to come up with a whole slew of ways of justifying it and and convincing the the left that, you know, we, we want this. We want, we want the IRS taking money and, and doing that. But anyway, that's just all silly politics. Um, but tax experts warn the so-called Fair Tax Act is not so fair to working families while giving the wealthiest Americans a break. Doesn't it seem that any taxation always somehow manages to give the wealthiest people uh, the tax benefits? I, I, you know, whatever. The bill HR 25 would eliminate all individual and corporate income taxes, capital gains, payroll taxes, and estate taxes while imposing a 23% sales tax on goods and services. And that's it in a nutshell. Um, and, you know, the argument is, well, you know, what about those who are on fixed incomes? What about those who are already retired and have already paid their uh, income taxes? And what about the people that this would potentially affect in a negative way? Well, A, it doesn't matter because it's not happening. But B, even if it were, the only way to, I think, fairly execute something like this, which I'm all for this. Okay, let's be honest, I'm all for this because I've always said that if I if there was a taxation system that gave me the freedom of choice and it wasn't just, you know, it, it was basically like, go out and make all the money you wanna make. Don't worry about paying taxes on any of it. But if you decide to go out and buy a Bentley with those newfound wealth or that newfound wealth, well, we're gonna tax you 23% on, on top of the sales price, which I got a taste of that in Puerto Rico because in Puerto Rico, pretty much everything has a really steep uh, import tax because nothing is on that island unless it was imported. And, you know, and, and there were so many taxes associated with the, the meals you had. I mean, if you went to a restaurant in Puerto Rico and you weren't basically paying double the price on the menu by the time you paid all the taxes and tip and everything else, um, you know, I would have been shocked. But that's just how it was. So everything uh, realistically was more expensive in Puerto Rico. But you get a big tax benefit there if you wanted to keep it and you wanted to trust the local banks. Uh, which I didn't, we left the tax benefits behind and moved out. Um, it just wasn't worth it. Uh, the, the, it was definitely a struggle there. Maybe if you live in Dorado, um, which everybody calls the big bubble and all of that, maybe things are a little bit better. But ultimately, um, I it, it was a struggle. And and we lived in a pretty nice area for the most part. Um, our, our house was in a gated community. It was, you know, all of that. But, the, you know, I would I, I don't think the locals would feel the same, but I would love to see Puerto Rico becoming a state uh, and start getting some significant federal uh, support in, in the infrastructure in Puerto Rico. Because while a lot of the old heads in Puerto Rico, the, the, the locals that have grown up there their entire lives may not like the idea of, you know, a big government coming in and, and changing things. It's an oppressive place. I mean, the reality of Puerto Rico is that the government there is so corrupt. And, you know, any support that the island gets, whether it's federal or from celebrities or whatever, I feel just gets squandered by people in power. And the, and the, the, the populace there um, ultimately pays the, the, pays the price for it and doesn't really see much benefit. And, and you, you really recognize the way that things are there. Uh, and and it was, it's very, very 
it's difficult. It's difficult to see because you, you, you can't live there and not want to make some changes and not want to help and not want to get involved. But then you start realizing like, it's not really my place. They don't want people like me involved. They don't want some, uh, some white dude coming in and trying to tell them what they think, uh, or what should be done to make things better. I mean, they just don't. And I understand that. So I just kind of say, okay, well, you know, it's not really my home. So let those who, whose home it is, um, dictate what happens. And, and, you know, it is what it is. And, and I, you know, it's a sensitive topic to me and my wife because, um, you know, we, 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 we have friends there that we care about and we, 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 we met a lot of really fantastic people in Puerto Rico. And I, I think for us coming from somewhere else, seeing what they have grown accustomed to and us wanting to make things better. I think that maybe that is our, is that our privilege? Like, like, what is that? I, I don't know. All I know is that we feel we came from a place that's better with better roads, better infrastructure, more opportunity and the ability to grow and excel in whatever field you want. Um, um, and there, it just felt like a lot of that is thwarted. Um, and so, you know, call it what you want, but we, we really like the idea of trying to, to trying to get involved and help. But, um, in any case, that's how it is there. You pretty much have a really high tax on everything in Puerto Rico. Um, and so, and it does create, uh, a, you've got the have nots and the havers, you know, I mean, it really did seem that way. People were either in really, really old cars or they in really new, nice cars, it didn't seem like there was much in between. Um, you know, so many of the areas in Puerto Rico are really run down and dilapidated and forgotten about. You see a lot of that all over the place, even in nicer areas. So I think that the taxation, I think it could benefit people, but it would have to be done in a very fair way. And I honestly, I believe that it should, it should be done. Um, you know, listen, make be tax exempt entirely. If you're retired, or if you're a veteran, you should be tax exempt. You should not have to pay taxes as a veteran, in my opinion, especially if you saw combat. You got a purple heart, never pay taxes again. I feel like that's just, but that's just me. Um, I'm not a veteran. I've never, I've never uh, joined the military, but I absolutely respect and value what those people do and the sacrifice that they make to basically enable people like me to do what I do. And, and there is a value to that. And I, and I, I think ultimately this kind of taxation would benefit more people than it would hurt. And, you know, if, uh, if, if, if it was like a global type of thing in the sense that, Hey, we are going to run this taxation and maybe you're a billionaire in the United States. And, you know, if you buy a jet in Honduras thinking you're going to escape this fair tax, well, you got another thing coming. Um, you know, there are ways to implement this in a, in a very fair way to make sure that everybody pays what is, is due. And I think honestly, putting a tax on, you know, basically giving the public a choice, you know, necessities, you know, necessity food items that should absolutely, uh, you know, not be taxed at a full, full, at a full extent, but luxury items should absolutely see the maximum tax. If I want to go out and buy a new uh, Mercedes, or I want to go out and, um, you know, whatever, I'll buy a nice big house over a certain square footage. I should probably pay an extra tax on that. If I can afford the property, I should be, but honestly, it doesn't matter how they did anything. It's going to get screwed up and ruined uh, regardless. It, it's all a matter of how can we get the most money out of our public? I mean, that's really what it boils down to. And when uh, either side, the right or left, believe that a fair tax is the best tax to get the most money out of the, out of society, then they'll, then they'll do it. Until then, we're not going to see it. So anyway, but that is something that I think could be playing a role in what's going on in the market. Uh, this is even bigger. The U.S. Federal Reserve is all but certain to raise rates 0.25 percentage points when it announces interest rates at 2 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, February 1st. Now, this, I think, is going to be a, a big deal. Even though we say that the markets are priced in in advance, maybe they are. But I think that when this hits, uh, I think this is going to cause some tremors in the market. And, and I don't think there's really anything anybody can do about that. I think this is real. I think it, as interest rates go up, I mean, think about it. You know, the government prints ad nauseum. They print all this money and ultimately they devalue, they debase the value of our U.S. currency. We're shipping so much money 
overseas for other things that really shouldn't i i don't think really um play a role on us uh but when you're looking at nato and you're i i feel like the world is ultimately creating two hemispheres you've got the BRICS nations you've got the you've got nato and um and then you have things like the world economic forum which i'm going to be sharing an article with here pretty soon uh that's really big news that some of you are probably going to like some of you might scare i don't know but uh i i think you've got this the BRICS nations you've got nato and you've got uh, instead of a one world uh unified government we're going to have two because ultimately when you're when you bring in things like the world economic forum that ultimately is basically an unelected government i mean it's i mean they they're controlling listen if you control or you have people that subscribe to an ideal or an agenda or a series of agendas and they have prominent positions in multiple countries well ultimately you're an unelected world government leader like klaus schwab is an unelected world government leader what he says gets filtered down to all of the people that follow his doctrine and they start instituting that but what we're seeing on a on a on a level we've never seen before is we're seeing so many of these uh these people that subscribe to this wef doctrine really falling like you know biden we're seeing him start to be unfold and for even even legacy media is starting to kind of nibble at his heels a bit um you know uh, trudeau is starting to suffer I, I you know all these people man i mean it's like there is it any wonder that they're all connected and they all share a certain philosophy or and even if it's not a philosophy they're sharing uh goals of a global interest that has not been elected by us and so they're very much in my opinion kind of rogue i mean that's just the way i look at it they're doing things not necessarily for the benefit of the public or the people but those that subscribe to um this this uh this ideal this this uh, this agenda for what i believe is to be more global control and like i've said before you know when people fly in on hundreds of private jets to talk about carbon emissions esg and and all of that and then eat steak dinners while they discuss how society should not eat meat but should like start using cricket powder and things like that these people do not have our best interests at heart because if they truly subscribe to this ideology of of global climate change and and all of that uh if they were that committed you know i don't know a vegan that sits down every once in a while even once a month and or, or once a year and says you know what i'm just gonna pow down this tomahawk steak just because i think i should and it's okay if i do it once in a while all the vegans i know are religious about it you know and they take pride in it and they want to share it with the world and they want to they want more people to join their their uh food cult um and to each their own I, I you know i have lots of friends that are vegan my wife and i we have friends that are vegan and uh i i'm always interested in hearing like what kind of concoctions do you come up with what you know uh but ultimately for me it doesn't really work out well um and and you know but i don't know a vegan that's gonna say hey you shouldn't eat meat don't eat meat it's terrible you're killing animals and then they run around once a year and and, and kill a pig and eat it i mean it just it doesn't happen to my knowledge maybe it does but those people aren't vegans anymore right um so when you're trying to tell me that i need to drive a certain car or not drive at all or maybe i should just start walking uh and i should start eating cricket powder and my sandwiches for protein instead of meat and then you know you're making these decisions after flying in you know a hundred thousand dollar trip on a private jet while you're eating a filet i i i'm sorry but i just if you don't have the conviction to follow it yourself then it's probably not anything i should be paying that much attention to practice what you preach or shut the fuck up there you go uh one dollar ada price beckons as cardano's jed stablecoin is finally scheduled for launch next week um the much anticipated jed stablecoin is scheduled for launch next week fostering expansion and novel applications in the rapidly developing decentralized finance sector of the cardano ecosystem we are pleased to share another update about jed's progress and to inform you that the launch is scheduled for next week Cody, a platform optimized for creating price stable coins and the soon to be official issuer of Jed announced Tuesday. 
Without hinting at a specific date for the launch, the Cody team, however, noted that they are technological developments they were currently working on. Key among them was the so-called chain indexing process, which they said would take 14 days to complete before JED launches. Chain index syncing refers to a process aimed at ensuring that all the nodes in a blockchain network are updated on issues such as transactions and block to keep the network healthy and secure. So uh, the team also noted that they were developing a snapshot feature and user interface to be integrated in JED. That's actually pretty good because a snapshot can empower them to do some pretty big things for security and um, potentially rollbacks, I guess, maybe. I'm not sure what they would use that for um, 100%. When launched, JED will become the first decentralized and over collateralized stablecoin built on Cardano. And, you know, people are thinking, oh, well, okay, when this launches, Jed is going to send, um, you know, the ADA price to a dollar. I, I don't think so. It's January 26th. I expect to see the market make a significant pullback. I think we're probably going to run up until about the first week of February, and then I think we're going to get our pullback. And I think that when we get that, so you figure this the, this this here marks the week of uh, February 6th. And I think that we're gonna pull, we're gonna come up a little bit. We're probably gonna see these blue bars, these blue candles tighten up a little. This is probably not even gonna touch, but right about when we get here, we're gonna see a pullback. That's what I think. And um, you know, whether it's a new low, I don't know. Uh, I think it could be because I think that the S and P five hundred is likely gonna break soon. I think we're gonna get pullbacks, significant pullbacks across the markets, across all markets. <laughs> excuse me and i think all of these are going to come down significantly and the thing of it is is we've seen a lot of this before as well the timing of things basically say we should be entering into a sideways market but i just still not sold on um i'm still not sold that the bottom is in yet even if we broke into 13 grand i'd probably be convinced like okay you know thirteen thousand. Uh, we're 2000, 2000 below the latest and uh, maybe the bottom is in at that point. However, this could change quite a bit. World Economic Forum's digital asset head expects real world blockchain adoption in 2023. This is a big deal. Cryptocurrencies post the Terra Luna FTX failures were a debated topic at the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos in the week through January 20th with some authorities calling for a doubling down on regulations. <laughs> Here we go, baby. This is what's happening. Others had a more nuanced view. Um, who's to say that we don't have one final, one final, um, how, how, you know, when I'm thinking in my head, how would this play out if I were the leader of the World Economic Forum and I were a decision maker for all of these efforts to usher in some st really strong regulation? You know, what have we learned? Okay, when, when, when governments want to take control away from us, what do they have to do first? Well, they have to make us fearful. We have to be afraid. We have to almost ask for it because they don't want to revolt in the U.S. They don't want people super pissed off. They don't want their, their their elected puppets to basically be pushed out of office and leaving them powerless. So they want us to basically feel like we need these things in place in order for them to bring them, bring them for our protection, for our safety, for whatever. And here's the thing. I do believe we need better regulation in the crypto space. There's really no question about that. Some may disagree, but we do need regulation. But... When given an inch, the government loves to take a mile. And once they've taken it, they don't give it back. You, they, they never make changes and then say, okay, well, this served its purpose. We're going to give it back. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So I would, I would even suspect that before we start seeing some significant integration, I'm going to continue on with this article in a minute, but before we start seeing some significant integration, uh, with you know traditional markets and things like that, uh, real significant global use cases on the blockchain. I could see us having another big uh, a big negative event that sends us into new lows. Maybe that happens in February. I don't know. Let's take a look at the rest of this article and see what they have to say. 
Shang Peng Zhao, the chief executive officer of Binance, the world's biggest crypto exchange, said in a talk at Davos that the industry now needs to focus on the evolution and promise of blockchain technology itself. The World Economic Forum's head of blockchain and digital assets, I do not know how I would pronounce that name, Brinley Lear, I don't know, shared similar views, especially around blockchain applications and sustainability efforts in the environment. In an interview at Davos with Forecast, news editor-in-chief Angie Lau Lear Lear argued that 2023 should see more real-world adoption of blockchain technology. The following Q&A has been edited for clarity and length. What do you think of the trending issues? Uh, What do you think the trending issues are and what's top of mind for people post-Davos? I would say... The through line has been about case studies, real world case studies, enough of the technical theory, although that's interesting. It is time to really showcase the real use case that we see today. I thought one of the biggest takeaways was interoperability. That's what I've always been saying. There are different ecosystems and yet we're all participating in a global digital economy. So when it comes to migrating from the old world view to the new, Uh, the old world to the new, if that interoperability doesn't exist, is liquidity going to be trapped in the old ecosystem? It's a good question. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And that is where the work comes in and why the forum is so useful because we bring together those different voices to come up with that interoperability solution like Cardano. (laughs) Because we are not small villages kept to ourselves, we are global. The year 2022 started with Terra Luna and then ended with FTX. I note that financial institutions might have withdrawn interest in cryptocurrencies as a speculative alternative asset, but they did not withdraw their interest in investing in blockchain. The technology didn't fail. That's a very good point. That's a good point so far. It is about what the blockchain can enable, what is possible, and I still see a lot of enthusiasm around there. This goes back to the work that we're doing at the forum related to crypto impact. So we're working with entrepreneurs around the world in the U.S. and in the U.S. Right now, we're focused on the U.S. Of course you are. We're going to expand it. We see a number of use cases and a number of developers that continue to be energized and continue working on these projects. And I think you will see money coming into them. As new participants enter this space, how do you ensure a move to the digital economy that embraces more than the few? One, do we all need to be corralled together? Maybe, maybe not. Interesting point, interesting. Basically saying, "Mm, you know, me and my friends, maybe we can be involved in, in some of these projects from the beginning and the rest can just catch up whenever, it's no big deal. We don't have to all be lumped into the same stuff. I mean, in in essence, it's true, but I mean, some of the benefit of a decentralized system is that you get a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of diversity in what is being developed. So I think there is something to be said for keeping that diversity. We shouldn't all be at a single file line. The other, basically that is true, but ultimately I don't think we should all be a form of tribalism as well. And I'm guilty of it sometimes as well. The other is, how will we get there? I think we follow the path of the user. I think when people realize that using these products makes a difference in their lives and they start using them, and we see where the adoption is, that's where we go. Where is 2023 headed for you as you lead these global conversations? I see, oops, sorry. I don't want to do that. I see some really interesting work in the area of sustainability and environment. We've already been focused on that, but I've made connections this week that make me even more excited about that. Food security, I think is very much related. Some really interesting ideas coming out of that and proof of concepts and many people that are interested in trying out some really interesting business cases. So I think this is going to be a year of real action, development, study, and research. Go get yourself a Murder Crows NFT if you want. (laughs) If you appreciate what I do, um, this is just a fun way to help support me in the channel uh, because I do use the funds that I generate from these uh, beautiful pieces of art. Um, and uh, yeah, I use them for so blocks. I use them for Wargram. I use them to play to pay my developers and things, even though it's not much. Uh, it's not much at all. I mean, it, you know, luckily for me, 
you know, the murder of Crow's NFT collection does trickle in little bits of, of ADA for me here and there. Uh, and I put it to use. Unfortunately, I'm having to put it to use in a bear market where the values are pretty low. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, that's what I see is happening. That's what I think is going on. I think we're going to get, we could get something that basically says, okay, once and for all, we need some serious draconian regulation to come down and protect the people from everything happening in the world and all these bad actors and these bad, projects and and so forth and so on and it'll send the price coming down even further and then maybe that'll be our last leg down that's when a lot of these major whales will get in if they haven't already if they're not already accumulating in i just think and you know i could do a video on all of the different ways that you, you can easily create two stories. You could say, you know what, look at all the different things that are pointing to this being uh, a reversal into a bull market. Maybe we go sideways for a significant period of time. We could go sideways for a year from here, folks. I mean, anything can happen. Uh, or we could get a new bottom and, and then go sideways and then slowly start inching our way up until the halving. Uh, anything could happen at this point, but I am still in the school of expecting a significant drop. I, I've been saying this for a long time. I'm either going to be um, I'm either going to be a prophet or a buffoon. I mean, it is what it is. I, I accept the reality of either one, uh, but I just think that the the stars are aligning more in in favor of a significant drop. Maybe we don't get a new low, but we're definitely going to get a, a low soon. And uh, you know, I am probably going to start averaging in officially next week, um, averaging in since my first uh, purchase of ADA. Uh, and, um, and then I'm probably just going to start a daily, a daily buy for a while and then see what happens. If we go lower, fantastic. If we don't, I'll just be averaging in. Um, and you know, that's all there is to it. So listen, it is Thursday, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a fantastic week. I hope your week's been going well so far. Um, check out murder of crows.io also have a big, big update coming on. So blocks. Um, we are very likely going to be updating it with a major, major update to the user interface some functionality, a lot of stuff you're not seeing yet. And we're probably going to open it to the public here very soon and start growing it out as an open public beta as we start integrating some of these major, major systems. Um, if you don't know, Soblox is going to have an, uh, a tokenizer. You're going to be able to mint uh, your own tokens, your own NFTs right there on the platform. We're going to have an NFT marketplace built into the system. Um, we're going to have an NFT search engine built right into the system. And maybe, depending on how this call I have going, we may have a DeFi platform on Cardano integrated into the system as well. So we shall see. Uh, it's going to take some time. It's going to be, we're going to be growing this thing. All of this stuff hopefully will be launched before the halving. Uh, but uh, grow with us, will you? Right now, you can get access to SoBlox if you have a Murder of Crows NFT in your NAMI wallet. And you'll use that to log in and create your account and start um, start chopping it up. So until next time, guys, crow your coins, and I will see you again very soon.